Did you know that every day your heart beats a hundred thousand times? A hundred thousand times a day. If you do the math, that means that over the course of an average lifetime, your heart will beat 2.5 billion times. It'll pump 60 million gallons of blood. Just to give you a little perspective, 60 million gallons is enough to fill three of these super tankers, all right? So over the course of your lifetime, you could fill up three super tankers. Your body contains about 60,000 miles of blood vessels. The smallest of them, they're called capillaries. They cover over 70,000 square feet inside your body. They take blood to every cell, bringing oxygen and nutrients and everything that you need to live and carrying away carbon dioxide and waste that would poison you if it, you, if it remained. And in the time that it has just taken me to tell you this, a drop of your blood has traveled from your heart throughout your body and back to your heart again. Isn't that amazing? It's just like Leviticus 17, 11. God tells the Israelites, the life of the body is in its blood. And it is so true. There are no cells in the human body that can live without continual contact of life-giving blood. Blood protects us from harm, it heals our wounds, and it brings us life. Well, today we're starting a new series called Blood Work. This Wednesday actually marks the beginning of Lent, which if you're not familiar with that, that is the 40-day or so period during which followers of Jesus around the world take time to reflect on Jesus' blood work. That is, Jesus' blood shed for us in His work on the cross, His life given for us to make us right with God. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, this season is known as the season of bright sadness. I love that description. It's bright sadness. It's sad because it's a time for us to grieve Jesus' suffering and his death. And of course, to repent and confess and, and repent of our sin that made his sacrifice necessary. So it's sad, but it's also bright because this season ends with Easter, with the celebration and the hope that come from knowing that Jesus didn't stay dead, but that he rose from the dead. And so our main guide over the next eight weeks we're going to take from now through easter we're going to take a walk with jesus to the cross and our main guide during this journey is going to be the gospel of john which was written by jesus friend and disciple john i, I want to invite you to be reading ahead reading with us we're starting in chapter 13 and we're going through chapter 20 so each week we're going to do a chapter not the whole thing we don't have time but each we're going to do part of a chapter but you read the whole chapter and just use this as a time the next eight weeks to eight sundays to prepare your heart and mind to reflect somberly on jesus death for you and then to celebrate with all you have his resurrection now, John wrote his gospel in two parts. That's something interesting I discovered this week. So chapters 1 through 12 is the first half of John. That records Jesus' public ministry to the masses. The second half of John, chapters 13 through 20, which again is what we're going to be focusing on, it just covers two days, the last two days of Jesus' life, Thursday and Friday. It is very personal. It's just, it's not the masses. There's no crowds, not very many other people. It's just Jesus and his disciples and his final thoughts and words and actions for them. So let's dive in. We're in John 13. We'll start in verse 1. It says, Before the Passover celebration, let's stop right, right off the bat, stop for a minute for some context. The Jewish Passover, which is still practiced today, by the way, it is Monday, this year it's on Monday, April 22nd. The Jewish Passover was a major Jewish feast and holy day. By Jesus' time, it had already been observed, been, been being observed by the Jews for 1,500 years. The Passover is a celebration of God's miraculous delivery of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. The main character is Moses, who was sent by God to the king of Egypt to demand the, the Israelites' freedom. And when the king refused, God sent 10 plagues on the Egyptians to change his mind. And the 10th and final plague was the worst. It was the angel of death. We can read this story in Exodus chapter 12. This is what God says. Each household of Israel must slaughter a lamb or young goat at twilight. 
They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. Verse 12, on that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where the name comes from, Passover. This plague of death will not touch you. And that's exactly what happened. That night, the angel of death went through the land of Egypt, and every firstborn son from the king on down died. But those whose homes were marked by the blood of the lamb on their doorpost were passed over. They were spared, not because of their worthiness or their religious fervor, but simply because they believed God and were marked by the blood. Now, in case this is beginning to sound a little familiar. This indeed is way back in Exodus. This indeed is a foreshadowing of the work of Jesus on the cross for us because it is by His blood that we are forgiven and reconciled and brought near to God. And it is no accident at all that Jesus, who was called the Lamb of God, it's no accident that He was crucified during Passover week because this is where it all converges. It all comes together and we see that Jesus is the ultimate and the final Passover Lamb. And through Jesus, God, the angel of death, passes us over and we have life. All right, back to verse 1. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. And stop again here for just a second. Jesus is is in his final hours, and, and he knows that he will never again speak to the large crowds. He will never again experience the popularity and the adulation of all the people around him. From here on out, Jesus knows it is deep suffering. It is great pain, physical, mental, emotional, especially spiritual. And then... It is mission accomplished. So Jesus knows that it's his final hour. Notice that it says that it says Jesus knew. That means Jesus knew exactly who he was and why he had come. All right, let's be very clear on this. Jesus was not a victim of circumstances. He was not caught up in some volatile political religious situation. He was in control every step of the way. He was and is Lord over it all. The fake trial, the beating, the mocking, the spitting, the humiliation, the crucifixion, even his death. He chose when he gave up his spirit. There's not one single moment in this story where Jesus is surprised or whether where he is overpowered or caught off guard. There's also not one moment when Jesus couldn't have just called off the whole thing and said, I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm not going to do this. He knows exactly what he's getting into, and he moves forward willingly. How come? Keep reading. Verse 1, he had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Jesus loved his disciples. Jesus loved his followers. He knows the terrible events that are coming, how shocked he'll be with his death. And then how surprised they'll be with his resurrection. He also knows that after his resurrection, he's going to send them out into the world for the rest of their lives to share his love and life with others. And so so Jesus is riveted. He's laser focused right now on preparing them in this moment for the moments to come. And by the way, Jesus didn't just love his followers then. He loves his followers now. What was true for them is true for you and me too. Jesus loves you. Not in some Jesus loves you, some sappy, emotional, L-U-V kind of way. No, no. Jesus loves you fully. He loves you perfectly, without condition. His love is not something that you earn. It is something that He freely gives without reservation or hesitation. Yes, I know you're a mess. I am too. Yes, I know you're broken. I am too. Yes, I know there are so many, many things you wish you could redo and take back. I have those things too. But Jesus' love does not hang on any one of those things. I said this before, but it is, it is true. If you were the only person on earth, Jesus would still have died for you. And 
if you were the only person on earth, Jesus would still have had to die for you in order to bring you his life. Jesus had to do his blood work and he wanted to. Verse 2, it was time for supper and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Judas is the villain in the story. He betrays Jesus, sells him out so that the authorities can identify him. Do you think that Jesus loved Judas? Judas was one of his disciples, one of his followers. Do you think Jesus loved him? Absolutely. Did Jesus know that Judas was going to betray him when he invited Judas to follow him in the first place? Absolutely. Could Judas, even at this late hour, could Judas have turned away from this act? Absolutely. Could Judas, after the fact, could he have repented after his betrayal and been forgiven? Absolutely. He didn't. But here's the thing. It's never too late. You are never so far from God that you can't come back unless you choose not to. And there does come a time when your heart is so hard that you won't go back, but that doesn't mean you can't. And so for those of you who feel like, oh, I'm too far gone. No, you're not. Jesus loves you fully, absolutely, without reservation, completely. And he's inviting you, longing for you to come to him. Verse 3, Jesus knew, there it is again, he knew, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and they had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Now, foot washing in the ancient world was very, very important. And think about it. It's, it's really practical. You're wearing sandals all the time. <laughs> You're walking through dusty streets and dirty fields. You step in mud. You step in animal poo, I suppose. Their feet must have been filthy and smelly. Now, I wear flip-flops a lot here in Florida because I can, and I hope this isn't too much information, but sometimes when I meet people in my office at Panera, I think, oh my goodness, my feet stink. And maybe you thought that too if you met with me. If so, sorry <laughs> about that. They probably had stinky, smelly feet. And so foot washing was very important, but here's the other thing you need to know about foot washing in the ancient world. It was viewed as a degrading and lowly task, right? Washing someone else's feet was only for those who were below you on the social scale, okay? So, so only somebody who was beneath you on the social scale could wash your feet. A child could wash his or her parents' feet. A wife could wash her husband's feet. Sorry, wives, that's the way it was back then, not the way it is now, but even, even a child or a wife washing parent or husband's feet, even that was, was a rare, it was a rare act of really extreme devotion. It's like, wow, you must really love him. Okay, so foot washing was really for servants and slaves. It wasn't for us to do for one another. And for you to allow to someone who was above you to wash your feet, that was scandalous. You just didn't do that. Even if they offered, you said, no, 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 thanks, that's, that's not right. Not that anyone actually offered. So what's really fascinating to me about this passage here is, it says, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God, so he washed their feet. That is, in light of the fact that Jesus was himself God, in light of the fact that he had authority over all creation, because of that, he washed his disciples' feet. Now, for you and me, there's something that doesn't ring true about that. The way we want to read it is, in spite of the fact that he was God, in spite of the fact that he had power over everything, Jesus humbled himself and washed his disciples' dirty, stinky feet. But that's not what it says. It says, because he was God, because he had power, he washed their feet. So there's two spiritual truths that come up right here. The first one is this. It is the heart of God to serve and sacrifice and give of himself to us. It's who he is. It is the heart of God to give of himself 
to us. Don't ever doubt God's goodness or his posture toward you because he is for you. He is with you. He is working in you. It's who he is. Because he is God, he washed their feet. It's his character. Here's the second truth. When we know who we are through Jesus, we are freed up to do the same. Okay, when you know who you are, when your identity is in Christ, you are then also freed up to serve people in the radical ways that Jesus served. You know, all of our, all of our posturing and, and positioning and, and presenting is done because we are insecure, because we're striving for a higher place or a better spot in line. We're seeking the approval of someone. Sometimes it's a parent or a spouse. Sometimes often it's just other people in general. And we, we care so much what other people think and we want their approval. Robert McGee in his book, The Search for Significance, which by the way, if you haven't read that, uh, man, it's just a great workbook for working through your stuff, all right? The Search for Significance. He says that our problem is that we believe this lie, and it's a false equation. We believe the lie that my self-worth equals my performance plus other people's opinions, okay? My value comes from my performance and what other people think of me. I am what other people say I am. I find my value in, in what I perceive others think of me. But when we follow Jesus, McGee says, the true equation comes out, which is this. My self-worth equals Jesus' performance plus what God says about me. My value and my worth comes from Jesus, what He did for me, and what God says now is true about me because He did it. And how do I get free from that lie of being on the performance track? By knowing who I am in Christ by understanding that through Jesus, I am wholly loved and fully accepted and completely forgiven and utterly pleasing to God. In Christ, I stand approved by God and I stand before Him without shame or fear. I don't have to earn anything. I don't have to perform anything. Through Jesus, I am a new person. I'm remade into the image, into His image, and I have hope and a future. And my destiny, my future is to live with God and experience His glory and beauty and wonder and purpose. And that, that understanding will change everything in your life. All right, back to John. We're in verse 5 now. He began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but, but someday you will. <laughs> no, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, well then, then in that case, wash my hands and my head, Lord, as well, not just my feet. <laughs> this is such an intriguing interchange and 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 when you you dig into a little bit it gets even more intriguing in the original language and in, in the greek when jesus comes to, to peter it reads peter says lord you my feet that's all he says lord you my feet and for once in his life Pete, peter is speechless he's stunned as as of course all the disciples are and then in verse 8 peter says no well in the greek it reads you shall not wash my feet to the age. In other words, Peter says, never in all eternity will this happen. <laughs> It'll not happen now. It'll not happen in heaven. It will never happen. I am not worthy to have you wash my feet. Jesus is so wrong. And Jesus' reply is equally strong. He says, unless I wash you, Peter, you won't belong to me. And that word belong there, it means to have a part or a portion, or an inheritance. In other words, Jesus says, Peter, listen, unless I wash you, you won't receive the inheritance I want to bring you. And now Jesus has stopped talking about just washing physical feet here, right? He's pointing toward the washing that his death will bring. Peter, unless I wash you, 
unless I die for you to, to cleanse you before God. You cannot receive your inheritance from God unless you let me cleanse you, not just physically, but also spiritually, mentally, emotionally. You cannot be, you never will be clean. Several years ago, Ira Glass, who hosts the podcast This American Life, he did a show on regret. He, in the show, he refers to Frank Sinatra's song, My Way, I Did It My Way. And, and there's this line in there where Sinatra pretty kind of smugly sings regrets. I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. And Ira Glass to that response, really? Really? Too few to mention? <laughs> Not me, buddy. Not most people. And listen to this. Some regrets just never go away. People tell us they forgive us. We try to forgive ourselves, and we still know we did wrong. It hurt somebody. It was real. And that feeling, it can immobilize you. If you're lucky, it teaches you something that you take into other situations. But I think often it's just, it's just like this pebble in your shoe that teaches you nothing. It doesn't slow you down, really. It just hurts. It just hurts in this way that does not stop hurting. That's some pretty good theology there. And Ira Glass here is describing who we are outside of Christ. Glass is describing life as it is not to follow Jesus. No matter what you do, you can't wash it off. You can't get rid of that regret, that brokenness, that whatever it is. You can't make yourself clean. To which Jesus replies, you're right. You are absolutely right. So let me wash your feet. Let me cleanse your soul. I died to take on your regrets and your sorrows and your screw-ups and your sins. Give me your life and I will give you mine. Now, there is so much more we could talk about in this passage, but we're going to stop here. And I simply want to ask, how do you need to respond to this story? How is God prompting you to take a next step? Here are a few ideas. First, have you ever given yourself to Jesus? Have you ever surrendered your life to Him? That's the place to begin. It is, is, to, is to give yourself to Him. Let Him wash your feet, so to speak, and accept His death on the cross for you and His resurrection power in you. Here's a second thought. In what area of your life do you tend to or have you bought into the lie that who you are equals your performance plus other people's opinions? Okay, In, in what way are you living for other people in, in, instead of God, and, and I challenge you to, to bring that before Jesus and exchange the lie for the truth that through Him, you stand before God approved and without shame, without fear. You don't have to earn anything. You don't have to perform anything. You, through Jesus, you are a new person being remade into His image. Here's a third response. What do you need to confess? In what way are your feet dirty? Where do you need to come clean? Well, come clean. <laughs> confess before Him and someone else if you need to. And then receive the forgiveness that comes through Jesus' death and resurrection and live in that forgiveness. Let Him wash you. Let Him make you clean. Here's a fourth one. We didn't get to this part, but it's at, it's at the end of this passage. Jesus says, says, okay, now that I've washed your feet, go and wash other people's feet. And he, and he sends his disciples out. And we are sent, just like they were, we are sent to radically serve the people that God brings into our lives. So here's the question. Who is that in your life right now? Whose feet could you wash? Because you have been set free by Jesus' blood work in your life? Whose feet can you now go and wash? Who can you now go and serve? 
In whose life can you be the hands and feet of Jesus? Because that is your calling once he comes to live within you. All right, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the work that you did on the cross. The work to make us clean and right and pure, standing approved before God, forgiven, healed, made new. And Lord, in one way we know this, and another way we don't know this. And so I pray that you help us to step into that truth and step away from the lies that you flood us with your peace and your healing and your wholeness and your joy. Lord, wash us, make us clean by your power, and then send us out to help others do the same. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here. We'll see you next time.